Thanks very much. Thanks very much for inviting me to this um, event. I'm really excited to, uh, to interact with uh, more economists and think about economics problems. My name is Dave Bly. I'm going to talk about economics and probabilistic machine learning. Um, John asked me to give an overview of um, kind of the type of machine learning that I work on, and so I'll start out with a little bit of an overview, but then want to talk about some details um, around machine learning and economics that I've been um, working on lately to give you a sense of what it might look like when economics and machine learning meet. So um, I work in probabilistic modeling, and um, modern probabilistic modeling, I hope to show you, is an efficient way to discover meaningful patterns in massive data. Okay, so this is a picture that describes traditional machine learning, how you might use traditional machine learning and statistics to solve a modern problem. So you get a cookbook of machine learning ideas, you get a shoehorn so that you can get your problem into the requirements of one of those uh, machine learning ideas, and you never need just one idea, so you need a lot of duct tape in order to create a very ugly but interesting thing that spits out answers to your question. Probabilistic machine learning is more about doing a tinker toy type thing where you build a tailored procedure for the particular problem that you have at hand. And the, the, the advantages of probabilistic machine learning, building these tailored models to the problem that you care about, um, include composing and connecting reusable pieces, um, which I'll show you some, some a little later. Um, developing methods that are driven by your domain expertise and discipline knowledge and the particular questions that you have. Um, probabilistic machine learning has focused recently on large-scale data, both in terms of high-dimensional data and number of data points. Though it's not exclusively about this, there's been a focus on using these kinds of techniques to discover and use structure and unstructured data. So you have a big collection of data that's that, that you think has some hidden structure inside, and, and you can use probabilistic machine learning to discover what that structure might be. And in probabilistic machine learning, we've focused also on things like exploratory and observational and causal analyses. So I think this is a, uh, one, one uh, area in machine learning that could be very useful to economics problems. Okay, I'm not trying to sell you on it. The cookbook shoehorn duct tape approach is good. There's many software packages available. It's typically fast and scalable and a good way to get a quick first answer. Um, probabilistic machine learning can be more challenging to implement. That's something that we're working on in that community um, and may not be fast or scalable, but that also is something that we're working on in this community. The way I think about this kind of problem is with this probabilistic pipeline. It's kind of a almost a goofy flowchart where you start out with your knowledge about a discipline and a question you want to answer. Use it to make assumptions about your data. It's a graphical model, um, which basically a joint probability distribution of hidden and observed variables. Okay, you imagine the hidden variables that live in your data and how they interact to form the observations. Then your data and the assumptions you make together, you, you discover the patterns that live in your data that, that um, you're interested in. And finally, you use those discovered patterns to form predictions, explore your data, do whatever it is you are trying to do. Uh, so just some examples from my research group to give you a flavor of this uh, type of research. So this is a population genetics analysis of two billion <coughs> genetic measurements. Okay, this is actually the Pritchard Stevens Donnelly model of population genetics. That's a model that came out of the University of Chicago here, or I think so, um, and, uh, and analyzes our genomes to understand our, our ancestral, how we mix ancestral populations. Um, here's another example of overlapping communities discovered in a large network. Okay, so this is a 3.7 million node network. You can imagine you might have a, a network of social connections. This is a network of patents citing each other. And you want to uncover overlapping communities. So in a social network, for example, you might know some people from, uh, you know, from your neighborhood. You might know some people from work. You might know some people from your family. Um, and you want to identify how each person in the network exhibits these overlapping communities. And this is an example of uh, uncovering overlapping communities in a big network. Um, uh, 
I've done a lot of work on, on analyzing text, also with, with John, with John Lafferty. Um, this is an example of topics found in 1.8 million articles from the New York Times. So here, each little, uh, each little piece is uh, a topic. It's a group of words associated under a single theme. So here we have art, museum, gallery, artists, street, paintings, exhibition. And the way that this picture was made was we ingest 1.8 million articles from the New York Times and do some machine learning and, um, and uh, uncover these patterns of word co-occurrences that seem to persevere in that collection and then visualize them. Here's a neuroscience analysis of 220 million fMRI measurements. So here, this is another kind of super high dimensional data. This is fMRI data. And we're finding significant regions of brain activity as they connect to different stimuli that uh, the person is experiencing in an fMRI machine. More recently, we've been working with a historian who has two million diplomatic cables. Um, so uh, this is a historian at Columbia, Matt Connolly got two million cables that were sent between U.S. embassies in the 1970s. Okay, so this is, a, I think, a good example of this kind of tailored type of problem. And Matt wants to uncover events in these two million cables. So each cable has a sender or receiver, and there's two million of them. So even though Matt's a historian, he can't read all two million cables. He wants to find what significant events happen and what cables are associated with those events. He also doesn't have a catalog of events. He wants to discover that from these cables. And so we built a model based on topic models, but also based on other assumptions that we want to make about how history unfolds and things like that to uncover those events and then to lead the historian to his primary sources that make sense around those events. Okay, and then finally, these are item characteristics learned from 5.6 million purchases. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to this picture later in this talk, um, but this is a joint work with Susan Athey and with my postdoc, Fran Rui, and what we're doing is we are ingesting uh, massive amounts of people shopping at a grocery store, and we are learning the latent characteristics of each item in the grocery store and how they relate to each other. So in this particular segment of the, oh no, segment's the real word for you. In this particular piece of this larger map of items and their characteristics, you can see um, Mexican ingredients, food, Mexican food ingredients uh, all together. And we'll go back to this picture later and discuss it in detail. Okay, so that's all a bunch of examples of what kinds of things you might be able to do um, with this little uh, probabilistic pipeline. And our perspective is that this kind of customized or tailored data analysis is becoming important to many fields. And, and this pipeline separates the key activities of understanding what our knowledge is of the discipline and what kinds of assumptions we want to make based on that knowledge, doing computation, um, that re reflects the assumptions we want to make and can handle the data that we have, and then use, those com use that computation to solve whatever problem we're trying to solve. And this, I think, makes it easy to think about how to solve problems collaboratively between people like machine learners and economists. Now, we won't talk about this here, but what we need to work on in machine learning then, if we are gonna, if we are gonna live with this picture, is build a language for building models out of assumptions, flexible and expressive components, build algorithms that can scale to massive data and are generic, algorithms that, um, that can handle many, many models. So if you're familiar with Bayesian statistics, I'm sure most of you are, you know, this is kind of like applied Bayesian statistics. And when I say generic inference algorithms, I mean algorithms that don't worry about the functional form of the uh, of the model as much as you would have to if you were going to commit to exact inference or something like a Gibbs sampler. Um, and the third thing we work on is to develop new applications to stretch probabilistic modeling into new areas and, and to um, enrich this whole, uh, th this whole framework through continuing to solve new problems and have new challenges. Okay, there's another piece, an important piece, which is to criticize the model and, and go through this loop. Right? We want to make assumptions, uncover patterns, do what we need to do, understand what went right and what went wrong, and use that understanding to then revise our theories and assumptions um, and proceed. Okay, so that's my overview. It took about five minutes. Today, I want to discuss two threads of research with uh, Susan Athey's group. 
So, so Susan Athey and I have been working together for a couple of years. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I want to just tell you a little bit about, you know, we have some work in, works in progress that I want to tell you about um, around building probabilistic models to analyze large-scale consumer behavior. Okay, so these, this is data where many consumers are choosing among many items. Okay, so caveat is that I'm not an economist. So that means that I, when I say, I, I will say things about economics that might not make sense. That's my fault. Uh, if I say anything about economics that does make sense, that's Susan's fault. Okay. <laughs> um, also, as I mentioned, this is joint work with Francisco Rui. Okay, so our big vision is that you know, we, we have this data, many people shopping in a, in a big grocery store and, um, and, they're, and they're buying lots of things, or it might be many people clicking on news articles, or it might be many people consuming other kinds of things. And our vision is that we, we want to build a utility model for baskets of items, where the utility of a basket has a bunch of terms. One of these terms, for the first term here, is the interaction between those items, right? One, something that might reflect substitute and complement patterns. Okay, if that made sense, that's thanks to Susan. If it didn't make sense, it's my fault. Another term might be uh, user preferences. So this term, the shopper term, might reflect the particular um, shopper and uh, you know what the shopper is buying in the basket and, and how that shopper prefers or doesn't prefer some of those items in the basket. And those preferences could be correlated across items. There might be an effect based on prices of items, of course, and other things we didn't think about, and an error term. Okay, so our, this is our vision to build up this utility model of, of a basket. And our goal then is to design, fit, and check, and revise this model, um, and eventually to answer counterfactual questions about purchase behavior. And since this is an overview talk, I just want to point out that in you know, I'm, I'm painting a cartoon, but in a lot of machine learning, these kinds of counterfactual questions are not on anyone's radar, right? We want to do pure prediction. And um, so it's been exciting to work on a problem where, where we have this um, deeper, more meaningful type of question to answer, to try to answer. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to talk about a, a way to, to think about substitutes and complements, um, co-purchases in um, in this, this market basket data. And uh, we've been working on something called economic embeddings. In machine learning, uh, a, a, a very uh, a newly popular technique is called word embeddings. This is a method for analyzing language. And word embeddings are proving to be very powerful. The idea in a word embedding is to discover what's called a distributed representation of words. So somehow you have big corpora of text documents, and you got a vocabulary of, say, 100,000 words, you want to identify what are the characteristics of the different words. That's called a distributed representation. It's a famous old paper by Rummelhart and others in cognitive science around how distributed representations of words might be useful. And recently in machine learning, we've been trying to discover them ourselves. Um, uh, with words, it's distances in the space of the feature representation of the vocabulary appear to capture semantic similarity, right? So king and queen might be close to each other in this space. Peanut and walnut might be close to each other in this space. There's a, if you look it up on the internet, you'll find 10,000 papers about word embeddings, each one a little different and a little the same. Um, but they each reflect the same main ideas. One, we place words in a low dimensional latent space. Uh, we're going to discover these characteristics. We're not going to know in advance that king and queen are close to each other. And two, a word's probability in, a, in an underlying probability model of language is going to depend on its distance to other words in its context. Okay, so if you see the word uh, queen in the context of other words, then the probability of queen depends on uh, the distance of that word to the other word's representations. So what we've been trying to do in my group is, is generalize this idea um, to, to other types of data. And we've been developing something called exponential family embeddings for this purpose. Uh, this is kind of like a, the way you might go from linear regression to generalized linear models from a word embedding to a exponential family embedding. And it uses exponential families and generalized linear models. And we've been um, uh, exploring this idea in a lot of different contexts, like neuroscience, recommendation systems, network analysis, and uh, with Susan, shopping baskets. 
Okay, so here are some neuroscience and social network examples that um, we've been exploring. My talk is long, so I'm going to not dwell on it. So let's get right to discussing embeddings in an economic context. To give you the idea, let's imagine a vacation town deli. Okay, so this deli has um, six items in it. That's all it sells. Jam, Skippy peanut butter, Smucker's natural peanut butter. That's my preferred peanut butter. Coke, no Diet Coke. Bread and pizza. And people are going to walk into this deli and they're either going to buy pizza and soda or they're going to buy peanut butter, jam, and bread. Important, customers are only going to buy one type of peanut butter at a time. Okay? Nobody's going to buy two jars of different peanut butters. And I hope you agree with that. Items bought together or not are co-purchased or not. And the peanut butters are substitutes, right? So if, if Skippy was out of stock, I would likely buy Smucker's, okay? I'm ignoring a lot of issues like formal definitions, price, causality, things like that. But I want to capture this purchase behavior. I want to somehow take data from this deli and capture this, these facts. So what we're going to do, inspired by embeddings, is we're going to endow each item with two unknown locations in some real valued space. Okay, one of, those, one of those is called an embedding row. We're also going to call it an interaction coefficient. You'll see why in a second. And the other is called a context vector alpha. We'll also call that an attribute. You'll see why that as well. And the idea is that the conditional probability of each item in the, um, in the basket depends on its embedding row i. So here's the conditional probability of how many times I'm going to buy this item given everything else in the basket. And it's going to depend on its embedding, row i, and the context embeddings, or the attributes, of the other items in the basket. Okay, so again, it's, it's important, I'll keep repeating it. The alpha location, these are latent product attributes, characteristics of the other products. And rho indicates how product I interacts with other products' attributes. Okay, so there's some attribute that's like jamminess and breadiness, and peanut butter likes to be bought with jam, jammy and bready types of things, right? There's a pizza-ness type of attribute, and soda likes to be bought with pizza. Okay, that's the idea, and this comes from a Poisson. These are all counts, okay? And it's, it's actually not a real model, but don't worry about it, and don't ask me about it. It is a real utility function, though. So we took, we, we found a deli like this. It took us a long time. We got all their data. And we, um, we fit this little model, OK? And, and this is the result. So this is, um, we fit this model with, with two dimensions. And in this plot, the attributes, alpha, are um, red dots. The, um, Interaction coefficients, or embeddings, rho, are blue dots. And remember, there's a dot product here. So what you want to look at is the sign of the dot product between the, two, between the two pieces. So just to stare at this plot, here, let's see. Pizza and soda are never bought with bread, jam, and peanut butter, and vice versa. OK. So well, let's first look at what we know gets bought together. So um, bread and jelly get bought together in, this, in our little cartoon. And you can see that because right, these are in the same quadrant. They're going to have positive uh, value. Okay? Pizza and soda are never bought with bread, jam, or peanut butter. Um, uh, right, so here's soda and pizza. And, and determining if I'm going to buy soda, let's say I have jelly in my basket. Determining if I'm going to buy soda, I look at the red dot for jelly, right? because that's the, its context vector. And you can see that they're, they cross the um, the axes and they're going to have it's going to be a negative number and so pizza and soda is never going to be bought with pizza is never going to be bought with jelly. Um, okay, so this if you think about all those combinations, you can sort of see that the characteristics we just described are are depicted in this and we obtain this picture by fitting that model. Right, we just generated data. I'm, I lied when I said we found a real deli. We just generated data from this from this deli and then we um, and then we fit that model and that gave us this picture. Okay, bread, jam, and peanut butter are all bought together. Peanut, now let's look at the peanut butters. This is the important one. 
Peanut butter one is never bought with peanut butter two, right? Peanut butter one is bought with jelly and bread, okay? This, the dot product here is positive, even though it crosses an axis. But peanut butter one is never bought with peanut butter two. You can see that because peanut butter one is in this quadrant and peanut butter two is up there. Its red dot is up there, okay? Peanut butter two is never bought with peanut butter one. Okay, so somehow that's capturing, but not entirely, the, this, the fact that they are substitutes. But more important, or equally important, is that peanut butter one is bought with similar items as peanut butter two. Okay, so these two, th the, the blue dot tells you when you're gonna buy it. And these two blue dots are close together. Right? That means that they induce the distribution of these, um, and the red dots are close together too. So they induce the similar distributions of other items. Okay, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna play this game with that big data set in a second. Okay, so more generally, just to give you a, a sketch of the general idea here, these exponential family embeddings, the goal is to discover a useful representation of data. Okay, and, and the way we notate that, we have n observations. Um, xi is a, is a vector, the d vector. Um, and these might be language, sub neurons, social networks, or um, shopping, where we have items in baskets and the number of times they were purchased. And when you set up an exponential family embedding, you set up three ingredients, the context, the exponential family you're gonna use, and an embedding structure. And so the idea, this is a little, if you're not familiar, this is a little graphical model. It's nodes are random variables and edges are dependencies between random variables. This just describes sometimes a joint distribution. Um, but the idea here in this picture is uh, xi is my, is my observed data point. So xi, for example, might be, did I buy Oreos on this trip, okay? Rho sub i is the embedding for xi, okay? So in this case, that's gonna be the embedding vector for Oreos, or the interaction coefficients for Oreos. And you can see the red highlighted observations are the context of xi. Those are the other, other items in my basket, okay? That's the context of me buying Oreos. Maybe I'm buying Oreos with milk and with, um, uh, Coke. And alpha, uh, alpha J for each of those items, those are the context vectors for Oreos. Okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to model each data point condition on its context and on these latent variables, which are the embeddings and the context vectors. Okay? Now, here's a picture of the context. So uh, I already explained it, but the idea is that I'm going to model the black node condition on the red node, and then I'm gonna move this window over. I'm gonna model the second black node condition on those red nodes, then I'm gonna model the third black node condition on the red nodes. And you can see that each item plays two roles. It is modeled, but it's also appearing in the context of other items, okay? And so you can define these contexts in a lot of different settings. In language, we model words conditioned on the words around them. In neuroscience, we model neural activity and some scientific data conditioned on the other neurons around them. In a network, we model an edge conditioned on the other edges of the two nodes that we're trying to uh, discuss, trying to contemplate. And in shopping, we model a purchased item given the other item counts on the same trip. Okay, it's all, this is, this is all um, the idea of a context. Second, as I mentioned, we want to define the conditional exponential family. So in neuroscience, for example, that's real value data. And um, the conditional exponential family is a Gaussian. Um, here, uh, in shopping data, we're going to use a, a Poisson. And the idea is that the, the data I'm modeling, conditioned on its context, comes from an exponential family um, whose parameter is a function of the value of the observations in the context and these two types of vectors. The, embedding and the context vector, or in our, in our language here, the interaction coefficients and the attributes. Okay, and in particular, and you can see if you're familiar with generalized linear models, this is all um, mirroring the treatment of generalized linear models. The natural parameter for the, for the, um, for the data point is gonna be a function of the dot product of the embedding, or the interaction coefficients, and the um, context vectors or the attributes, okay? Put in plain language, if I'm buying Oreos, that depends on what Oreos likes to get bought with and what else is in my basket, okay? If I have 
carrots and celery in my basket, maybe I'm not buying Oreos, but if I have milk and Diet Coke in my basket, maybe I am buying Oreos. Finally, there's the embedding structure. And the embedding structure determines how these parameters are shared so that we can learn something about the items. Okay? And this is kind of a, um, a technicality, but the idea is that I'm going to, my data are, are, um, are purchase counts at different shopping trips, and, um, and I want to make sure that I learn something about Oreos across shopping trips. Okay? So I'm going to share rho and alpha for Oreos no matter what shopping trip it is, and when we set that up, it just looks like this, the same latent item characteristics and latent interaction coefficients are being used across shopping trips for the same item, Oreos, for example. And that's also how we learn something about neurons or about a node in a graph or about uh, um, a word in a, in, a, in a language modeling task. We fit this, um, we fit this uh, model, modeling each data point conditional on the others, and we combine these ingredients in, in what's called a pseudo likelihood, but for us it's basically just this utility function um, where we have the log probability of each observed item conditioned on its context plus some regularizers for the two different types of vectors. And we fit this with stochastic optimization where exponential families, this, the, the fact that we use exponential families makes these gradients simpler. Um, just an, a high level aside, you know, uh, uh, Stefan mentioned machine learning being successful in, in many, many different spheres, and um, it has been, and I think that is due in large part to stochastic optimization. So when you take the gradient, this resembles a collection of GLM likelihoods, doesn't matter, um, but um, you know, part of our goals in this work is to make a connection between these ideas in neural networks and probabilistic modeling, and the stochastic gradients of this pseudo likelihood connect to neural net ideas like negative sampling. So if you get interested in this sphere of ideas, you'll read about negative sampling in all of the word embedding papers, and that looks something like a stochastic gradient of this type of objective. Let me show you what, what we can do with this on some real data. So, um, we have purchase counts of items in shopping trips at a very large grocery store, and um, we're going to fit this in two ways. In one way, we're going to look at categories. Okay, so we're going to replace each item with its category, and there are 478 categories. So this is a data set of 6.8 million purchases, 635,000 baskets. Um, and we're also going to fit this at the item level, okay, where we have 5,675 different items. Um, 620,000 baskets and 5.6 million purchases. Again, I know I've mentioned this. Here the context is other items purchased in the same trip. The structure is that the embeddings for each item are shared across trips. And the conditional exponential family is a Poisson. And we also downweight the zeros. And there's, we can talk about that at the end. There's an open question there, but um, it's a good idea to downweight the zeros. Okay? Again, Recall the conditional probability is Poisson, and that we think of alpha as reflecting the attributes of item i, and rho is reflecting the interaction of item i with attributes of other items. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this data, 620,000 shopping trips, fit that model that I just described to you with stochastic optimization, sampling trips repeatedly and getting noisy gradients, and then fitting the vectors of all of these items. Um, and we're going to then visualize, I think we used 100 dimensions, but we're going to visualize alpha in two dimensions using a dimension reduction technique called TSNE to show you what it looks like. Here's a 2D representation of category attributes. All right, so uh, this is a T, so earlier with the um, peanut butter and the pizza, we, um, uh, I plotted the actual values because I had a two dimensional dimension reduction, two-dimensional uh, representation, but now we have 100 dimensions, and so this is a, um, this is a reduced dimension visualization of those 100 dimensions, and here are the category attributes, alpha i, and you can look at different pieces of this map, and you can see things like, you know, baking ingredients all going together, so this is like zooming in on one part of that big plot, and you can see that things you would use for baking all go together. Um, and here are things that you uh, need for babies all go together, okay? So that's ingesting market baskets, running this algorithm, getting alphas, the latent item characteristics, 
without any prior knowledge, and then um, projecting it down into two dimensions using this T-SNE algorithm. Okay, now here is that same procedure, but applied to items. All right, so now I've got however many it was, 5,000 items, and um, I, again, I got 100 dimensions, and again, I projected it down to two dimensions, and we get this map. And in this map, the colors are the categories of the items, just for us to see that the categories either mix or don't mix. The, that, that's what the color represents. OK, and now again, we can zoom in on some portions of that map to see what it's representing. And you can see things like, um, you know, here is uh, pasta and sauce together, right? In, in that map, they are commonly purchased together. Um, here is crackers and cheese, which I didn't know went well together, but thanks to the model, now I'm a big crackers and cheese eater. Um, and here is the Mexican food uh, section, right, where uh, we have shredded cheese and tortilla chips and um, tortillas and salsa all together on the map. Because this is a conference about machine learning and economics, in a machine learning talk, we need plots, we need slides like this. Okay, that say that we do the best. So we do the best. Okay. Um, what we did here, I can explain a tiny bit, is uh, we, so, you know, we want to assess how well this model is working. We can look at Mexican food maps and, you know, as satisfying as that is, um, it, it, it's, it's not a quantitative evaluation anyway. And um, so what we did was we took these 600,000 or so market baskets, and for each one we, we held out some, a few of the items, one or two of the items, and then we used our model to try to predict the probability of the held out items given the other items that are in there. And what we're comparing here are different dimension reduction methods. Okay, so um, uh, <clears throat> additive, Poisson, uh, uh, additive Poisson embedding and hierarchical Poisson factorization, this is actually the method I'm gonna tell you about in the second half of the talk. Uh, but it's, it's better than that method in this case. Poisson type of PCA, that's basically just PCA with a Poisson likelihood, um, is, an, is another kind of classical matrix factorization method. And in all these cases, the Poisson embedding method um, assigns higher probability to these held out items. It's a better fit of the data. It gives us a better estimate of the data. Um, Downweighting zeros is important. So that's what we learned at the category level. At the item level, we see the same kind of uh, pattern. Ultimately, though, we want to fit this model in order to understand something about patterns of purchase behavior. And so um, I'm going to define some terms, possibly correctly. Exchangeables. We're going to call two items exchangeable if they have a similar effect on the purchase of other items. Okay, being a little fast and loose with causal language, but if things are causal, exchangeables have a similar effect on the purchase of other items. Same category items tend to be exchangeable. They have a similar effect of, of the purchase of other items and rarely purchased together. Okay, so, so this is a subset of substitutes. Think about the two types of peanut butter, right? The, I'm gonna buy these two types of peanut butter with similar other items, but I'm never gonna buy these two types of peanut butter together. Complements are purchased or not purchased together. Okay, so like hot dogs and buns. Rarely will you buy hot dog buns, but not by hot dogs. So we want to try to take those embeddings that we fitted to the whole data set and try to capture some of these types of purchase patterns. And um, we have a way to do that. So remember, peanut butter one and peanut butter two induce similar distributions of other items, okay? You know that because their red dots are close to each other, right? The red dots are close to each other, so that means if I have peanut butter one or peanut butter two in my basket, the distribution of what other stuff I have in my basket is the same, no matter which peanut butter is in there. They are rarely purchased together. Remember, that's because the blue dot is far away from the red dot for the peanut butters. So <clears throat> let's define the sigmoid function between two items. The, it's uh, loosely the probability that I'm going to purchase one item given that I purchased the other item. Okay? And so this is the sigmoid ki is the probability of purchasing item k given i is in my basket. Okay, I switched from logistic to Poisson. We actually use Poisson, I just didn't update the slides, but it's, it's all the same for explaining this. Um, okay, so that's the probability that I, that I buy jam given that peanut butter is in my basket. And 
sigma ki bar is, the, is 1 minus that. Probably that I don't buy jam, given that peanut butter is in my basket. The substitute predictor, properly put in quotations, looks like this. Okay, and so what this is, the first term is something like an exchangeability measure. This is a measure of um, how similar, so, so, so let's be clear, there's two items at play, item i and item j, and this first term is the KL divergence, a measure of the difference in distribution between, um, between uh, whether or not I buy item K given that item I is in my basket and whether or not I buy item K given that item J is in my basket. Okay, so fix another item, say jam, and compute the kale divergence between the probability that I buy peanut butter one given that jam is in my basket and the probability that I buy peanut butter two given that jam is in my basket. Okay, that's this first term and I sum over all other items. Okay, so I look at each item and I ask what's the kale divergence between these two distributions and that is the, um, you know, that's a measure of, a, of how similar the distributions of other items are for each of these items. Okay, that's the first term. And then the second term penalizes us if these two items are bought together. Okay, so if peanut butter one and peanut butter two were bought together, then that second term penalizes us for that. Okay, that wants peanut butter, that, what this wants is that when I buy peanut butter one, I am not going to buy peanut butter two. The complement predictor is the negative of the last term. Okay, so this is finding something like co-purchases. That, um, w that, that when, I buy uh, when I buy jam, I'm going to buy pizza. No, when I buy jam, I'm going to buy bread. Okay, that's the complement predictor. And I, I gave the non-symmetrized version of these. We use symmetrized version of both quantities. Um, and these quantities generalize to other exponential families. So, you know, one thing I'm interested in doing basically next week is to ask the question, can we think about complements and um, substitutes in the context of these other applications that we've been um, thinking about embeddings in, for example, in language, right? You can imagine that a substitute in language is a synonym and a complement in language is two words that go together, right, like New York. First, let's look at the category level. Here's some example co-purchases at the category level, and what you can see is um, things like organic vegetables and organic fruits go together, vegetables and beets, baby food and diapers, cranberries and stuffing, gravy and stuffing, pie filling and evaporated milk, you know, because you need, if you get the canned pie filling, you need evaporated milk to make the pie, um, deli cheese, cheese and crackers, pasta and sauce, and so on, mayonnaise and mustard. Here are the top 10 potential substitutes at the category level. And first, let me explain something about what we did with this data. So we here, we moved to categories in the, be, precisely because we didn't want to deal with the complexity of substitutes. And so in this work where we're trying to think about how to identify possible substitutes, um, we engineered our data in a way where we took pizza, the pizza category, and we artificially divided it in half. Okay, we said, okay, half of these are pizza type one and half of these are pizza type two. And so hidden in this category level data that, that we analyzed for this particular table are substitutes that we know are actual substitutes where, you know, we just took half the pizzas and called them one type and half and called them the other type. And then when you look at that measure on that fitted model to that data, you see that in the top 10, these engineered substitutes all rise to the top, right? We identified that pizza one and pizza two are indeed, uh, are indeed in the same category. Bottled water one and bottled water two are as well, and so on. So that's one thing. But interesting is that even though we move to the category level in order to avoid this issue, we see that same category items are still in there, like bouquet and roses, or bouquets and blooming. And another one, although it's lower on the list, is block ice and beverage ice. So accounting for this kind of purchase pattern um, could be important even at the category level. Okay, so now let's go to the UPC level, to the item level. So here are example items that we co-purchase at the, at the UPC level. And what you see are things like yogurts, um, different kinds of beans, different kinds of cat food, rutabagas and parsnips. Not sure. Um, apples and celery, 
Here are hamburgers and buns, mangoes and kiwis, and so on. Here's taco seasoning and shredded cheese, Star Magazine and In Touch Magazine, and so on. Okay, and this, you know, I'm not sure about this table. I think those maps kind of reflect this idea a little bit better, but this is what we get from that measure, a way to identify these, these items that are purchased together. But now, here are potential substitutes at the item level. Okay, and um, I felt that this was exciting because this is hard to get out of that map. Um, so you see that um, potential substitutes are two different sizes of coffee. You wouldn't go in and buy two different sizes of coffee. If they said they were out of one size, maybe you would move to the other size. A regular sized and large sized sandwich, same with the coffee. Um, two different kinds of flowers, uh, two different types of sushi, the semi freddy's baguette and the crusty sweet baguette, right? Maybe you won't buy two different types of baguettes. Um, different kinds of gum, two different kinds of candy bars, and so on. Detergents, the same type of beer in a bottle and the same type of beer in a can. Um, and these two types of salads, one is called Greek salad and the other is called Neptune salad. We can assume they are both Greek salads. So, um, you know, this is the kinds of potential substitutes we find at the item level and um, yeah, so that's, that's where we are with this analysis now. Okay, so in summary, word em of this first half of the talk, word embeddings have become a staple in natural language processing, and what I've told you about today is how we distilled their essential elements and generalized them to consumer-level data. Um, and this has been working in a lot of different contexts for us, so also in recommendation systems and in neuroscience and um, modeling people reading scientific articles and here in the shopping baskets data. Okay, but there are some questions, of course. So one is, how can we capture higher order structure in the embeddings, right? Somehow, looking at pairwise relationships to uncover categories is unsatisfying. You might want to think about if there is high level structure in these, in these attributes, which, which of course we know there is. If we could really observe those attributes, there might be hierarchical structure or clustering structure. So how can we um, capture that in this kind of model? The second question is, downweighting the zeros is important, but how do you justify that? And um, in some other work, we've worked on justifying that in the context of recommendation systems, and so um, you know, I hope we can look to that for inspiration for how to downweight that in this setting. And then, of course, you know, we demonstrated that we can find these, these purchase patterns at the item level with very large data sets, but how can we include things like price and other economic complexities um, in this kind of model? Okay, so the second thing I want to talk to you about with the same data set is Poisson factorization, a computationally efficient method for discovering correlated preferences. Again, we're looking at the same data set and um, we want to understand people's purchase behavior uh, through this data. In economics, we typically look at items within one category, like yogurt, um, and then try to estimate the effects of interventions, like coupons or price or layout or stockout. In machine learning, we look at all the items typically, not minding that they are all mixed up into complements and substitutes, estimate user preferences and make predictions. So this is recommendation. So when a, when a, if you hand this kind of data to a computer scientist, she's going to do something like in the Netflix challenge and, and run and uh, build a recommender system so that when you buy Oreos, it suggests that you should buy milk. Um, in machine learning, as I mentioned before, again, this is a cartoon, we typically ignore things like causal effects of interventions and, um, and applied causality, although that's changing happily. There's a really a nice new effort in causality in machine learning. Okay, so in Poisson factorization, this is work that we did um, uh, in the world of recommendation system. We're modeling something called implicit data. What implicit data means is it's users interacting with items. Okay, so this could be users clicking on articles on the web, it could be users liking things on the web, or it could be users purchasing things. It, there's less information than what's known as explicit data, which is when users rank items, ra sorry, rate items, like in Netflix you might give a movie one star or five stars, but it's much more prevalent. It's much easier to get this kind of Im what's called implicit feedback data than uh, explicit data. Okay, so here's a picture of users clicking on movies, and so a sample user might have seen Star Wars Empire Strikes Back 
I know that Wrath of Khan is actually Star Trek II, so that's a mistake in the slide. Um, but anyway, they might have seen those three movies and not seen those other movies, Return of the Jedi, When Harry Met Sally, Barefoot in the Park. And so what you want to do is, you know, in a typical machine learning application, is recommend to this user that um, they watch Return of the Jedi. So we've been working on this recently with something called Poisson factorization. Okay, and then this is now again a graphical model. Let me explain the graphical model a little bit more. So um, in a graphical model, like I said, nodes are random variables. Edges denote dependence between random variables. This is, I know you look at graphs like this in economics too. Here, we don't give any mechanistic or causal uh, story behind this. It's really simply a way to represent a factorized joint probability distribution. Okay, that's what it is. Um, where hidden variables are sh unshaded, observed variables are shaded, and these boxes represent, are called plates. They represent replication, right? You might have replication of, of variables that are distributed in the same way in your, in your joint, and um, that's what those boxes mean. So in this picture, this is the picture for uh, Poisson factorization. I'll try to describe it in the context of shopping. Here's the idea. YUI is whether or not user U bought item I. Okay, that's YUI. And you can see that there are these two plates. One is the plate for users and one is the plate for items. And, and YUI sits at their intersection because there is a, a YUI, whether or not the user bought an, an item, for each user and item. Theta U is a K vector, a vector of length K, and it represents the user's preferences. Okay, the user likes stuff. Theta U represents what the user likes. It's a K vector, and um, it's positive. Beta i represents what that item, who likes that item. Okay, so beta i is a k vector, and it represents uh, who, we call them latent attributes again, but it, it represents information that's going to help tell me who's going to like this item, who's going to purchase this item. And the way it works is that how many times a shopper purchased an item comes from a Poisson whose rate is the dot product between theta u and beta i. Okay? It's, there are echoes of the embedding ideas here, but it's a different model. Um, so we just take the inner product of my preferences and the item, you know, coffee's attributes, and if it's high, then I'm likely to buy the coffee. Okay? And so in graphical models, of course, again, this is basically ab applied Bayesian statistics. It's the posterior distribution that we care about, the probability of the user preferences, the item attributes, given the observed data of who bought what, reveals purchase patterns about people. All right, why is this advantageous? One, it captures heterogeneity among users. Okay, so, um, you know, Larry might, I think you have a cat, maybe not anymore. He had two and now he has one. Okay, so la we see Larry's cat. I won't make a joke about it. Um, yeah, so uh, I, had a, I had one, now I have zero uh, cats. So anyway, Larry might like organic vegetables and he has a cat, so he buys cat food, right? And so, so the, he's heterogeneous. John, thanks. Um, you know, John has a dog. He buys dog food, but he might also like organic vegetables. So they, they're, they're both similar in some ways, different in other ways. We can capture that kind of heterogeneity with this model. Um, for interesting and technical reasons, this implies a convenient distribution of total consumption, okay? How much stuff Larry's going to buy at the store, we can model that with this, with this picture, even though we're modeling each item individually. It's because of properties of the Poisson distribution. And most importantly, but also, yeah, most importantly, um, we can do efficient approximation of that posterior, um, only requiring the non-zero data. That too has to do with the functional form of the Poisson distribution. Um, I won't say why that happens. It's, it's something for the blackboard. But, um, but what we can do is even though we have you know, 5,000 items and however many hundreds of thousands of users, we can efficiently approximate that posterior um, only using the information about what each user bought, not using the zeros. And what happens is the zeros are still in the likelihood. They just are easy to work with um, uh, because of the nature of the Poisson. Okay, so we worked on this originally in the context of recommending articles to people. And um, in fact, they implemented this at the New York Times to give recommendations. And, um, and here are, for two different data sets, 
here are um, some of the components that we get. So what does this mean? I remember, each item, each user is represented as a vector of preferences. Each item is represented as a vector of attributes. And what I'm doing is taking an attribute and looking at the items that exhibit that attribute with the most strength. Okay? Um, by the way, if you're familiar, this is very similar to non-negative matrix factorization. It's kind of like a Bayesian version of non-negative matrix factorization. Um, and so we found interesting stuff, like in the news articles from the New York Times, you know, business self-help was one, I'm naming these, that's why it's in quotes, business self-help was one of these attributes, personal finance, all things airplane. So even though the New York Times doesn't have an airplane section, you know, there are some people that always click on airplane articles, and uh, like flying solo, crew only 787 flight is approved by the F. Hey, that's amazing, I didn't, that's crazy. Um, and, and so uh, these are the kinds of patterns that might not be available to the, whoever is making this, these items and, and implementing the system, and they can learn something about their users this way. Okay? With um, scientific articles from Mendeley, this is, this is uh, scholars like you sharing their, their libraries of scientific articles. We find things like um, biodiesel and astronomy and political science, again, patterns of usage. Okay? Again, machine learning talks require a plot like this or a slide like this, so it, it does better in lots of different ways. Um, and on the item data, the, the 600,000 um, uh, trips to the market, um, we also get patterns, okay? And so this is, this is how that looks here. So this is actually, this is on the category level data. Um, so there's like a fruit component with stone fruit and pears and tropical fruit and apples and grapes. There's the cat care component. Baby essentials component. I thought it was funny that coffee was number two in the baby component. <laughs> um, and uh, healthy, I don't know what to call it, where you buy soy milk and organic food and organic frozen vegetarian options. Um, and again, we can capture that, uh, that consumers are heterogeneous, right? Some ha ha like to eat healthy and have cats. Some have cats and um, have babies. We're interested in really folding this into an economics model. And um, one way to connect this to an economics model is like this. And this also has to do with properties of the Poisson distribution, but I think it's interesting. So imagine a utility model. So let's just imagine that we're not capturing the utility of baskets of items, but just we're going to purchase one item at a time. Um, and so we have the utility of an item, YUI. What's the utility of buying cat food? And let's imagine that that utility is log of theta u transpose beta i, right? The preferences transpose the attributes, but logged, you might not be used to seeing that log there, plus epsilon, where epsilon um, is a gumbel, okay? As usual for you, for me, it's where I learned about the gumbel. Now, suppose a shopper, some shopper u, buys n items, okay? Let's condition on that number of items that she's gonna buy, condition on n. Y u is gonna come from a multinomial of n items, right, a vector over items that sums to n, um, with probabilities pi u, all right, special probabilities pi u. Pi u i, the probability that, that user u buys item i, is proportional to the exponent of theta u transpose beta i in this little picture. Thank you. What does that mean? So this, I'm sure, is standard procedure for all of you, but what that means is again, because of the, the properties of the Poisson, that the unconditional distribution of counts for this user is going to be from a Poisson factorization, where y u j comes from a Poisson theta u transpose beta j. And, and that means that we can use Poisson factorization to analyze this large-scale consumer behavior data, and it is implicitly kind of assuming this utility model, up to all kinds of caveats. Okay, and so what we're doing now is we are exploiting this connection and devising new utility models that take into account various other properties of the shopping experience, like time of day, whether or not something's in stock, the date, so you, know, you can add date terms and find out that ice cream hap is, is more likely in the summer and that helps us calibrate people's preferences, um, observed item characteristics and category, demographic information about the shopper and so on. And what's nice is that inference is still efficient when we add in all of these complexities. And um, then with assumptions and with checking assumptions and trying to check assumptions, we can answer counterfactual questions. So that's how we're connecting this idea that we, we developed for recommendation systems into something that we can 
um, work on economics with. Okay, so Poisson factorization efficiently analyzes large-scale purchase behavior. Um, again, some of the next steps are to include these other these other these other properties of the um, of the shop of the shoppers, um, and research and recommendation can help economic analysis. That's satisfying. I said what I thought I was going to say next next by myself. Um, good. So that's that's my talk. Probabilistic machine learning lets us design expressive models to analyze data. You can tailor the method to the question you have and to your knowledge of the discipline. You can use generic and scalable inference, especially as we continue to develop those important tools, to analyze large data sets. I, you know, here we had 600,000 trips and, and um, many thousands of items. Um, and we needed to rely on things like stochastic optimization to fit models of that size. Um, and then form predictions, hypotheses, inferences, and revise the model, all with this very large scale data and with a technique that is specifically tailored to the, to the question that you have. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for economics and machine learning. One is to push economics towards high dimensional data and scalable computation. Two is to push machine learning to explainable models. You know, I, I like that in economics you care a lot about interpretability and um, that's something that is, uh, could be more important in machine learning and, and, and it pushes us there. Applied causal inference and new problems um, and developing new modeling methods together is a, a ripe uh, activity. Thanks very much. <laughs>
what I just said is kind of how I think about model misspecification. So I, I find um, that uh, you know, there's a line of work on what's called posterior predictive checks that is really interesting. It, it came out of Bayesian statistics, but it's really about essentially frequentist checks of Bayesian methods. Um, started with people like George Box, um, and then Don Rubin and Andrew Gelman have developed this, this set of methods, which is around, if I, loosely at a high level, if I set up a Bayesian model where I've hidden variables and observations and I get the posterior, and then I just immediately start making decisions based on the posterior, as I mentioned, that, that assumes that the model is true, right? And what George Box uh, pointed out many a long time ago, 1980 or before, is that uh, in order to understand whether or not that model is working, you need to step outside of the of the um, of the domain where uh, of the model. You have to step outside this assumption that the model is true, and that's what these posterior predictive checks do. Loosely, they generate new data from your estimates and then check whether that new data looks like the data you conditioned on. And if it doesn't, it's like a, it's like a Bayesian adaptation of a classical goodness of fit test. If it doesn't, then you've done something wrong and, and you need to revise your model. So, um, you know, I think that that kind of activity is, re is very important. And, uh, and, and that's what I think about model misspecification. I don't think there is a true model. I think these models are all simplifications and they're for a purpose. There's a knowledge and a question, right? It's, it's, you know, I've done a lot of work in topic modeling and, and with John, and we don't believe that text comes from a topic model. That would be insane to believe that. But rather, that particular characterization of the hidden variables in text is useful for building navigators based on themes that help somebody quickly explore massive data sets. So I, I, I'm personally am not sure there's a true model, although I'm not speaking for Susan here. So maybe you're saying we're, we're working on trying to adapt these posterior predictive checks, particularly for problems with counterfactual inference. So like in our data, we have stock outs and we have price changes. And so under some assumptions, you can identify price effects and so on. And so we're trying to adapt these posterior predictive check type of framework to assess whether, say, an unconfoundedness condition holds or um, to assess other aspects of the model for making counterfactual predictions about what happens when price change. So I think as you start to do counterfactuals, you have to really think harder about, um, you know, about how you're assessing your model. And I think that's kind of forcing this connection to happen. Yeah, that's a great point. So if the question is a causal question, it might it, it, depending on how crude that causal question is, it might not be that you need the actual mechanism in your hand in order to answer that causal question, but that other assumptions that wash out some of the details are enough to, um, to answer it. And, but then you need to be able to check these certain assumptions, and so that's one of the uh, research threads that we're doing. I mean, maybe also just back to your question. I mean, so these are Bayesian models. So one, one difference between these class of models and other types of machine learning models, like just a straight matrix factorization, is that, I mean, really, like, this is not very different than, you know, a, a BLP model or some of the big models that are used in marketing um, by Rossi and so on. The bunch of latent variables, we have a Bayesian model of these latent variables. It's, it's the same thing. There's nothing really too different except for we can compute them. Um, and there's some, there's some approximations and debates about exactly how you think about the fact that we're computing them in a different way, but roughly they're just larger scale versions of economic Bayesian latent variable models. I wanted to make two other points, although this is a whole, we could be all night at a bar talking about this. Um, so one is that, you know, another difference between machine learning sometimes and classical Bayesian statistics is that in machine learning, we often use what's called variational inference to, to approximate the posterior here. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Um, where unlike something like MCMC, there are no guarantees that you're really sampling from the posterior of your model, even if you wait forever. And that's very unsettling um, to many. But if you don't think your model is true, then it's OK, because you can check this bundle of your model and the inference procedure. Um, and so that's another place where model misspecification is, is crucial, or thinking about model misspecification is crucial, in that we have given up on, um, given up's the wrong word, we don't need to, a pro to, to, get, uh, to have uh, a procedure that gives, gives us the, the exact posterior in some long-term infinite limit. It's not advantageous because we don't have infinite amount of time. And so um, we need ways of checking this, even if we had a true model. 
you asked about how we came up with the Poisson model. And um, I'll tell you the, the answer. We were working on a different model. Uh, Prem Gopalan and I were working on a model for, um, for, uh, for finding overlapping communities and massive social networks. And there was this paper by Mark Newman and Ball and Carer, Newman, Ball and Carer, which used Poisson factorization style models to, um, to analyze networks. And it was a little funny because um, there were, the parameters grew with the size of the network, but it seemed to have some good properties. And so we were inspired by that and thought, okay, let's look into this. And then of course, when we went back, that kind of model had also been tried in <coughs> computer science by John Canney um, in 2004 and in statistics by, by people like David Dunson. So. Uh, it was it was it was it was good at prediction. It was good at predicting held out links, um, and then we thought more about these kinds of properties about how it models total consumption in the context of a to social network. It models that you just can't have a bazillion friends. Right? You can only have so many friends, um, and the inference. Right then we then we sort of saw the advantages in inference, and so these three totally different considerations led us to that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.